Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing week number 10 in the NFL, breaking down Ed's numbers and what they say about a pretty fun slate of games. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, I am excited because this week has a couple of big divisional matchups. Last week, I thought we'd get the same thing, and then Drew Brees and the Saints kind of just dropped the hammer on the Bucks. So how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good because, I, I mean, I did like New Orleans when, when we talked <laughs> last week. So, um, you know, it was it was a game that I meant to watch some of, but it got out of hand so quickly that, um, yeah, there wasn't there really wasn't much left. And yeah. the New Orleans defense that has kind of struggled all year uh, – was, was able to hold down a Tampa Bay offense that, you know, my numbers don't particularly like, but I know they've struggled with injuries a little bit as well. And then New Orleans' offense doing what, what they can do against a very good defense. Yeah, and I, um, I was in the same boat where I was excited to watch that game, and then usually I have a tough time because we have a recap podcast every Monday, Monday morning for Daily Fantasy stuff, and I have a tough time because, like, I'm trying to work on that, but then I get distracted by Sunday Night Football – Right. I didn't have to get distracted because the game was a blowout. So honestly, like it was great for me to have yeah. the game go the way it did. I was happy for your numbers, uh, liking the Saints there as well. So it was, uh, I was okay with it. I would hope though that we see some more competitive games on Sunday because I love uh, the matchup between the Rams and the Seahawks. I think that's phenomenal. Sure. I kind of don't hate the Giants Eagles game just because, like, in Week Seven when they played. Uh, my wife was trying to have a Zoom call with her parents, and I just kept cackling on the couch next to her because, like, Carson Wentz and <laughs> Daniel Jones just kept playing hero ball. And, like, it was it was one of the most enjoyable football games I've ever seen because it was so bad. So, like, right. I want to watch part two, baby. <laughs> yeah, kind of like watching a train wreck, right? But yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, I think I think it'll be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go through Ed's numbers on these games, see what they say about them, and it should be a fun discussion. We'll do that here in just a bit. But first, if you're looking for some college football action, we talked with Mike Craig yesterday. He's a professional sports better, talked about college football, got his insights on which markets he likes most, why he decides to go into certain markets and go away from them, and just get his thoughts on some big Week 11 games. And Ed, I mean, it was, it was a really fun conversation with Mike, so I appreciate you lining that up. Yeah, absolutely. Mike is an uh, incredibly intelligent guy, and it's always good to talk sports betting with him. Yeah, so if you want to find that interview with Mike Craig, just search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, iHeartRadio, Radio.com. No matter where you find your podcasts, you can find us. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review as well. Before we dive into week number 10, though, we got to look back at last week. In addition to that Buck saints game, had a lot of other goodness from Peter Jennings of Fantasy Labs. So let's see what we had there first. Covering the past. Last week here on Covering the Spread, we had Peter Jennings on to preview week nine in the NFL. Find Peter on Twitter at CSU Ram88. Make sure you check out his work over at Fantasy Labs and the Action Network. Peter was on the under for Ravens Colts at 46 and a half. It actually closed at 48, so it moved the wrong way, but didn't matter. It went under pretty easily with the Colts offense not being able to move the ball. So good call by Peter there. Also good call for him in the Bills versus the Seahawks where Peter had faith in the Bills plus three against Seattle. And that's where it closed too. But that faith was well founded. The Bills jumped out to an early lead, able to hold it throughout to win by 10. So another win by Peter there. You have had faith in the Texans this year, Ed, and Peter did too in week nine. Uh, the markets did as well. He had it at six. It closed at seven, so it was a good price. But the Jaguars, actually pretty frisky with Jake Luton at quarterback. Uh, the Texans won, but the Jaguars covered. And Ed, like, I joke about this, about Jake Luton being an upgrade over Gardner Minshew. But, like, I don't think it's the most outrageous thing in the world if it wound up being true. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a one-game sample size. The thing that I'm horrified is just the complete inadequacy of Houston's defense. Yeah. I mean, they're letting this kid, Luton, just spin away from them and waltz into the end zone to to get a potential tying score. I mean, it was kind of, you know, I mean, Deshaun Watson's great, 
He's yeah. going to put up points. He's going to do things that Deshaun Watson does. But to pair that with the defense that leaves a lot to be desired is is pretty tough. Yeah, I mean, like, the Texans are fun. We were talking yesterday with Mike about how there are a lot of under teams, you know, under programs, under teams, et cetera. Right. The Texans are an over team because yep. that offense can go silly. That defense can go silly in the wrong way. Uh, and at least a lot of fun games for sure. Peter was in on the Panthers as big underdogs against the Chiefs at 10 and a half. And it closed at 10. And actually, I think it was like 12 at one point. Uh, closed at 10 though. And the Panthers covered pretty easily. They actually had a chance to win that game outright. So a good bet from Peter there being on the Panthers. Peter wanted the Bears plus six and a half against the Titans. It did close at six, which is good. And the Bears, they came out really flat. Uh, they did make a valiant effort to try to get the backdoor cover, brought it down to a touchdown, but they couldn't quite get there. Uh, so a close one, but not quite there. And finally, uh, Peter had the Broncos plus four against the Falcons. It's another one where he almost got the cover late because the Broncos scored 21 points in the fourth quarter to make it close. Uh, the Falcons did cover. Drew Locke, for whatever reason, the first three quarters is just hideous. The fourth quarter, <laughs> he's Patrick Mahomes. I don't get it. Prefer if he'd be fourth quarter Drew Locke for all four quarters, but, you know, whatever. Uh, so some good bets from Peter there, finding a lot of value being looking for the best price of FanDuel Sportsbook. So, again, make sure you are acting like Peter, looking for the best odds uh, and seeing what numbers you can get that are enticing at FanDuel Sportsbook. One of the ones that he wanted uh, that you talked him out of was actually that Buck Saints game because Peter was tempted by the Bucks minus four. And you said, I don't know, man. I kind of like the Saints plus four. And it closed to three, so the market was in your favor. And the Saints blasted them. So it's beneficial you talked Peter out of that, but also just uh, another, again, a good performance there by your numbers and liking the Saints. Yeah, no, I was definitely pleased with that. I mean, it, it's kind of gone against Tampa Bay a number of times, and that hasn't always worked out. So uh, it was nice to, to get one there. And it's interesting how it kind of shakes up our uh, – like our vision of the NFC. Yeah. I Kevin Cole at PFF on my podcast this week. And I, I always ask guests to make a bold prediction for the rest of the season. And he was saying that I was going to say that New Orleans was going to win the NFC and go to the Super Bowl. And then it doesn't seem that bold after, <laughs> after that set of games. So, you know, we're always updating. Um, we're always updating our analysis of these teams. And uh, yeah, we'll continue to do that. I got to, you know, I think that, if you are akin to a guy like uh, Drew Dinsick, Will Capper, and you kind of look at the schedule and see when these inflection points may be, maybe you were able to get in on the Saints before that game. Uh, if you like the Saints in that game, maybe you like them to bet uh, for some conference outrights and stuff. But the NFC is a really interesting conference because I don't think there really is a definitive favorite right now. So. We'll see yeah. how things shake out there. A final one here for last week was I had the over on Raiders versus Chargers at 52 and a half. It actually went down to 51 and a half and then shot back up to 53 right before kickoff. And it did go over uh, 57 points. So that was good. Not a an easy cover by any means, but hey, you know, a win's a win. And with the way the past couple weeks have gone for me, I will take whatever I can get uh, <laughs> getting the over there with the uh, Raiders and the Chargers. Pretty fun game. The Raiders couldn't are. There, what's that? Couldn't, couldn't there have been some more points? Like I, I yeah. thought, I read, like the Chargers dropped some touchdown passes, and there, they there dropped was a touchdown stuff. pass with no time on the board. So it would have been a comfortable cover then. Like they covered, I think, with like nine minutes left, or they got the over with nine okay. minutes left. So like it could have been comfortable, but like these things happen. So like I'll, I'm again, I'm not complaining. I'll take 57. I'll take the over for sure. Could have been right. maybe a little bit more, but yeah, I think that I think the process was there. I think that the results were there too. So. A win's a win, and I'll happily take it. Yeah. Justin Herbert is now 0-6 in one-score games. <laughs> is it possible, like... Like, I know we joke about the Chargers being cursed. Is it possible that's no longer a joke? Are they just actually cursed? I mean, I don't really believe in being cursed in terms of analyzing football teams, but, you know... Maybe you should, Ed. Maybe that's maybe, well, maybe that you need to adjust for that in the power ranks numbers. Like, yeah. is this team cursed? Are they are they the Falcons or the Chargers? If yes, you got to adjust things there. Uh, yeah, maybe Michigan is cursed in terms of big plays <laughs> because they always <laughs> underperform their success rate numbers. Um, no, I mean there's a lot of randomness and just you know, yeah, I don't know. 
I'll take it, though. I'll take it. That's yeah. all that matters. And we had a good week last week. So we'll celebrate that and hope we can duplicate it once again in week number 10. Before we get there, though, betting on the NFL is great. Betting on the NFL risk-free is even better. FanDuel Sportsbook is giving you a chance to bet on week 10 of the NFL risk-free with their exclusive same-game parlays. Simply place a three-leg or more parlay on any NFL week 10 game to be eligible. If you don't win your bet... FanDuel will refund your bet up to $10 in site credit. What do you have to lose? Must be 21 plus and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Tennessee. Refund issued is a non drawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $10. Terms apply. Gambling problem? In New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Illinois, call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Iowa, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Colorado, call 1-800-522-4700. In Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Or in Tennessee, call the Tennessee Red Line, 1-800-889-9789. Let's take a look at week number 10 now, dive into Ed's numbers, and see what they say about this week's big divisional games. Covering the present. So two big divisional games coming up here in week number 10. Eagles at the Giants. We have the Seahawks at the Rams. We'll also talk Bills at the Cardinals. But before we do that, I do want to go through some overall stuff. Because, Ed, we had the chance last week to talk about your college football numbers and how you had to tweak your model for this year because there were no non-conference games. Now, obviously, that's not an issue in the NFL. So did you make any tweaks on the NFL side of things entering the season to adjust for the coronavirus? Or did you, were you able to keep things pretty straightforward from last year? No, I kept things pretty straightforward from last year because the schedule is basically the same. All the data I needed in terms of the markets during the preseason were, were there. That was not the case for college football. So, yeah, I mean, I roughly kept everything the same. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, the key ingredients are properly weighting of, of kind of a preseason component, uh, a component that looks at closing point spreads from, from past games, uh, my market rankings. And then um, data from the current season. So points, success rate, yards per pass attempt. So give those a proper rating. And we'll talk about some of those in, specifically in, in some of these games. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's actually been a really good year at this point. We're through nine weeks. Um, the way I uh, – I mean, obviously, how you perform ATS is one metric of, of how well your model is working. Uh, I find that to be pretty noisy and jump jumpy from, from kind of week to week, season to season. So what I really – try to look at is is the root mean squared error so like if i make a prediction um that uh the eagles are going to win by three points and they win by 10 points then the difference between that is seven and then you square that for 49 and you would add up all those errors before taking the square root so that's just your root mean squared error and um right now after week nine like my my predictions have actually had a smaller root mean squared error than the closing line um from the market so i i scraped on breast i take the median line and compare those so um usually it's pretty close usually it's within about one percent or at least it has been in past seasons right now uh we're at a point where it's just just the tick better so i've been pretty confident with how the numbers have been working and um yeah hope 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 to continue do you have any ideas to why things may be performing so well this year i mean obviously like you know Maybe they're just good numbers, uh, but like if it's the same method you've been using in the past, do you have a thought process as to what may have led to the numbers performing that way this year? So I saw I saw a significant uh, kind of decrease in the air when I started adding this success rate stuff, and, I, and I'm still not sure if it's completely optimal how I'm doing it, but I definitely saw a leap there. Um, I don't know why it's doing better this year. Remember, there's still going to be some randomness in just, you know, 133 games that, that we're looking at so far. Um, but one thing like, you know, take a team like Tampa Bay, you know, I was almost, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of thing in my success. There's a lot of aspects of my success rate numbers that I don't say yeah. necessarily on the podcast because they don't necessarily make sense <laughs> and i'm not going to offer the ones from this season quite yet but one of the ones from last season was tampa bay's defense was the best in the the nfl yeah. in terms of success rate i don't think i ever mentioned that because it seemed kind of dumb uh tampa i think bay you did in the off season actually uh, when brady off? signed there i think you may have mentioned it thanks i remember hearing that i don't know if i heard it like i don't know when i heard it but i'm pretty sure i heard you mention that at some point so Tampa Bay's defense wasn't that great last year, and that's because the offense just kept turning the ball over, I think, right. 41 times. So 
it's it's kind of one of those situations where the the success rate stuff is saying one thing and and this defense could be good but it doesn't really show up necessarily in your numbers and your predictions because of other factors such as turnovers so maybe it's more of a thing where the turnovers aren't skewing things quite so much um you know philadelphia has terrible success rate numbers and they're terrible in the turnover department too (laughs) so they go hand in hand um i don't know um we'll see how things kind of progress forward but but i've been really happy with the model this year uh and will work in the offseason to make it even better for next year. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully this offseason will be less chaotic so we can uh, have more time to do that rather than, you know, worrying about whether there will be a season and trying to scramble uh, once it becomes more clear that it is. Uh, Early in the season, we saw a lot of totals going over like crazy. And you would say that your numbers, you know, I mean, like in general, it's it's hard to keep up when there are major deviations. We're looking at historic data, et cetera, et cetera. But... Now we've got nine weeks in the books. Have things stabilized a bit more, or have you had to do more tweaking when it comes to trying to to pin these totals? Yeah, I mean, in terms of my model, like I don't I don't really look at my totals model for NFL. Like I warn all my members, I don't advertise it when yeah. you look to become a member because I know it's not good. It's the same thing I do it in college, and what works in college just doesn't work as well in the NFL. Yeah. And and I have years of uh, I I need to work on it at some point, and and hopefully get to that in the off season. But but what happens is that the markets have really been behind uh, the scoring output uh, this season in the NFL. So, I mean, in just week nine, uh, teams averaged almost 53 points per game. And uh, the year-long average has been almost 51 points. But the market average total in the game was just a shade under 49. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this. Like, the, the markets have just been a little bit below and that past data is kind of what I use in my totals model. So there's there's one half of my totals model that's kind of pulling the total down in a way that we know is a little bit too much, probably. I mean, you know, you can you can argue that we expect regression. But, you know, as we'll talk about in one of the games a little bit later, like I actually think one of the reasons there's so many points is that there are so many quarterbacks, corner, cornerbacks that are hurt. Yeah. And there are not a lot of quarterbacks. There, there tend to, there's less quarterbacks that are hurt. Um I think that makes a huge difference. You know, cornerbacks are they're they're not in uh, they're in high demand, but there's not a huge supply of them that can do it at the NFL level. Uh, I think that's part of it. So, um, yeah, when we go in with totals, I, I think I'm I'm using more other types of information uh, when I look to I, I'm I'm less looking at my model for that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and uh, for me at least, it's always kind of anecdotal when it comes to totals as well, just because like I need to like look for changes in things, try to find those edges. And we'll talk about that in my cover in the future too, because there is a game here that's pretty interesting and it may or may not be Eagles at Giants. Let's start things off there with our game by game breakdowns. Uh, the Eagles here, three and a half point favorites, a total 44 and a half over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And Ed, uh, another nice thing for you before the season, you talked about Carson Wentz and he, how he should be throwing more picks than he has. That obviously has happened. He's actually thrown a ton of picks, but as a result of that, we've seen sentiment swing really heavily against them. And I think that that's always an interesting situation where you are ahead of a swing. Do you buy back then when things go drastically the other way? So are you thinking we have a window here to buy into the Eagles or should we expect the struggles here to continue? Not necessarily in this game. I don't don't know if I would, I I don't have really a strong opinion on this game and and we'll get to that at the end. Um, Carson Wentz, uh, you know, thanks for mentioning that. His his pick rate, I think, was in the five percent, was over five percent at some point, and I argued that it should regress from there and and uh, you know back to more towards the NFL average of two point four, two point five percent. So his bad ball numbers, uh, which I found to be very predictive of future interception rate, his bad ball numbers are basically league average. They weren't spectacular like his pick rate. So so we expect him to get closer to 2.4, 2.5%. And for the season, he's at 3.9%. So starting at 5%, he's had to get a little bit better doing that. Um, overall, uh, you know, this unit isn't good. Um, I, I think Wentz hasn't been good. His accuracy hasn't been good. And then he's dealing with a lot of injuries at uh, the receiver position. Zach Ertz is out as well. So when I look at adjusted success rate on passing plays, they're, they're 29th. Uh, and that's pretty bad. But on the other side of the ball, you have the New York Giants. And this team is kind of built exactly the wrong way. Uh, they're excelling in the ground game. Yep. So uh, when I look at my adjusted success rate, they're fifth on offense and they're, they're fourth on defense. 
Um, but when you look at the pass game, they're terrible. Uh, 25th on offense with, with that Daniel Jones offense. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, dead last uh, on defense. So they kind of built the exact opposite way that you want to build a team in the NFL. You'd rather be strong both in the passing game and, and defending the pass. And and the thing that my numbers like is that the piece, the Eagles pass defense isn't terrible. They're they're about league average. And so that's part of my reasons why my numbers like the Eagles in this game. Uh, I have it exactly at three and a half points, uh, which is a, where I believe the market is right now. You know, I was slightly lean towards Philadelphia just because they had a bye week last week uh, and New York didn't. But um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see a ton of value in this game. That doesn't mean there won't be in the future for the Eagles. What's wild about the Giants thing is that the the team building stuff you mentioned is intentional. Like last year, they traded for Leonard Williams. Leonard Williams like has had like one sack in his career, but he's a good right. run defender. They traded a third and I think a conditional fifth round pick for him, and then franchise tagged him. I think they franchise tagged him and brought him back. They drafted Saquon Barkley, obviously, second overall. They took a, right. uh, used a high pick on Will Hernandez as, as a guard, and I like Hernandez a lot. And guards, guards are underrated in the passing game, but, like, I don't think that's why Dave Gettleman took him. Like, the fact that they're good against the run and decent as a running team, it's intentional, and I feel like that's such an indictment of the front office to, like, <laughs> be doing this in freaking 2020, but, like... <laughs> It's, it's just so obvious that that's the way they're doing things. Well, I mean, Gettleman's known to have uh, been against the analytics. I know he supposedly had changed that and had hired some people. He hired some Was... computer folks, I think he said. Computer folks? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the verbiage he used. So they got some shy dudes that they stick in the basement to build some database that has no use exactly. whatsoever <laughs> in terms of building the team. Yeah, so, I mean... Yeah, it's exactly the wrong way to build a team. Um, and yeah, they're, they're not doing well right now. So we'll see. Just brutal. Um, and like, you never want to root for a team to fail. But like, if you're going to root for a team to fail, might as well, might as well be one that bashes analytics. Uh, right. We'll talk more about this game in my covering the future. Let's move now, though, to the Bills at the Cardinals. Cardinals here, one and a half point favorites. Total is 56 and a half. And we've talked about this a couple of times now, where your numbers are high on Josh Allen. And they have been for 2020 specifically, previously no, but this year specifically, and he made you look really good last week. So is that enough to get you to back the Bills here as a road underdog? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think Josh Allen was very good last week. I think the Buffalo defense was spectacular last week. I mean, they were in Russell Wilson's face the entire game and and really pushed him to do some things that, that he didn't really want to do. Um but, yeah, so let's actually talk about Buffalo at Arizona. Um, so this is an interesting game. Like I mentioned before, you know, everything's uh, a combination of preseason prior uh, market-based numbers and this season's data. And this season's data actually has Arizona by two, about two and a half points. So it would suggest that the, the market's pretty fair. I, I was seeing a lot of twos this morning, so um, and, and that's actually where I, where I, where I bet this. But... I'm not, you know, I think there's some noise in this estimate. You know, we have nine weeks of data. It's not necessarily that, you know, my success rate numbers are going to be spot on. Um, they're probably not spot on even after 16 games. So let's just be honest, right? So, you know, can we figure out, like, which way it should go? Um, so so Arizona's defense actually looks pretty good compared to Buffalo's defense. So, uh, and this is one big factor that goes in. Arizona's 14th in adjusted success rate. Buffalo's 29th. But, I mean, I think Buffalo's defense is probably a lot better than that. Uh, you know, they've had a pretty good reputation uh, under Sean McDermott. And this is also supported by PFF grades. So the, the defense ranks 22nd overall when you look at their grades. Um, I, these are not adjusted for opponent. So just throwing that out there. But they're also 16th in the more important aspect of coverage. So I, I think that they're, they're probably better than, than, than that 29th. Um, Arizona, they might be league average, but uh, their PFF grades actually had the defense 24th overall and, and 23rd in coverage. And I, I think it's interesting because they've made a big point in the emphasis on how coverage really, really matters. It, it matters more than pass rush in terms of stopping the pass. Nick Saban just came out and emphasized. So there was that article where Nick Saban came out and said, you know, uh, college football is all about offense now. 
But what actually got hidden in, in that article is that he said that on defense, you really have to look at how your secondary covers. So Nick Saban's saying the same thing. I think a lot of these ideas from uh, the NFL are kind of filtering down to college football. And, you know, like when I'm handicapping a game, like I'm looking at the quarterback position and I'm looking at how the secondary covers. And I'm trying to think more about like, you know, using the PFF grades as like in addition to sure. what I'm looking at in passing success rate. Um, so anyways, I think Arizona's defense might be a little bit higher. Uh, might be a little bit higher in my numbers than they actually are. I think Buffalo's number defense is a little bit lower than they actually are. Other thing you have to look at that. Yeah. The <laughs> other thing you have to look at in this game is uh, critical injuries in the secondary. Yes. I talked about before how I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of points. There's a lot of teams have cornerbacks that have gotten hurt. So for Arizona, Drake Kirkpatrick and Byron Murphy both did not play in the last game. They're both questionable uh, probably likely to be out for this game. The last game they missed against was Miami. Um, they allowed a 53% passing success rate to to a Tongo Bailoa. So that's not a really good sign about what's going on in their secondary. Buffalo has their own problems. Uh, Tr- Tredavious White is got banged up in the last game. I think he came off. Uh, he is questionable. But he you know, practiced Thursday, which. Okay. He didn't practice Wednesday. I've been watching this uh, for the same reasons as you. Um, but he practiced <laughs> Thursday, and that was like the first time since week four that they've had Tredavious White, and they had a couple linebackers in this time too. Like, they're right. trending one way health-wise. The Cardinals are trending the opposite way. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the, yeah, the Bills aren't perfect, right? I mean, Josh Norman's only played three games this year uh, in the middle of the season. I don't know when he's coming back. Um, but... You know, Tredavious White is probably the best cover corner. So if, if he can play, that would be good. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out. But, like, I think the odds are, like, injuries are going to hurt Arizona more than they hurt uh, Buffalo. But actually, let's get to the real reason why I like Buffalo in this game. They're, they're just better on offense, in the pass offense. So I've hated on Josh Allen in the past. But, <laughs> I mean, the guy has just been good. So they're six when I look at uh, adjusted success rate and pass offense. He's got an 85 PFF pass grade, and I just have a lot of confidence. Like, even in the, the Tennessee game where they lost, like, he was making plays. He was consistently making those short and intermediate throws, and that's what the success rate shows you. Kyler Murray's been very good as well, but, the you know, Arizona ranks 10th in my adjusted pass rate, not as good as the 6th of Buffalo, and then his pass grade in PFF is, is 74. So, again, not as, as good as Allen. Um, anyways, I, I like Buffalo – plus two a lot in this game. Um, it's a little crazy that uh, <laughs> I'm getting bets on Josh Allen these days, but I, I just think this is a, I think this is a good game for Buffalo. And uh, I, you know, I, th- I think they, you know, I, my numbers like, I think they I think they favored Arizona by a slight bit. Um, right. But I think there's some value. I think there's some value here for sure. in Buffalo plus two. Yeah. And I Actually, that... sorry. My numbers like Buffalo by like about a half point. Okay. Numbers. So Bill's plus one and a half is pretty easily. Value then, for sure. You you bet it at two, right? I got it at two. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, absolutely. And I think that I can push back on Josh Allen as much as I want, which I like you had done previously. But like, I think the good thing about Josh Allen is you can kind of tell when he's going to be good and kind of tell when he's not going to be good. And I agree with you, where I don't think this Arizona defense is a not going to be good situation if we're going to classify things that way, which is you know kind of simplistic. But I think that if we're looking at it that way. There's no Chandler Jones. Obviously, I agree where we should favor coverage over Rush. But, you know, if they're not going to get a Josh Allen, that's fewer opportunities for Josh Allen to go 2019 Josh Allen, where he goes, (laughs) just loses his brain and does something very stupid, which can throw away a cover. That's not as likely to happen if there's no Chandler Jones and there are injuries in the secondary. So I think you're right on here. I I totally agree. The Bills are the the right side of this game because I think their defense, like you said, should get better with the health trending up, the Cardinals defense trending the other way. So I think the Bills are the right way to go here as well. Let's finish up here with Seahawks at Rams. Rams two-point favorites. Total here is 55.5. And And we've talked about the Rams a couple of times because the market data on them is very interesting. And you've talked about them because in the preseason, you said the market viewed them as being a mediocre team. And very quickly, they adjusted to view them as being like a top flight team. So if we look at your numbers, what do they say about the Rams and this game going in? 
Yeah, so let's just start with the markets, right? Like the markets had uh, the Rams dead dead average, and and they moved up because you know because they played well. You know, a lot of my numbers, you know, you can argue that you know at one point they had only beaten NFC East teams, but you know my numbers account for that. Like they adjust for that when um, when you're evaluating the Rams. I, I think they are better. They are pretty good. Uh, but I think the markets have moved pretty strong on Seattle. Like they saw what they were doing on offense. They saw they were letting Russell Wilson throw on early downs, which is, I mean, so, someone has to be able to figure out whatever the expected points added of that is. Oh my like it's got to be it's <laughs> insane, right? And you see like the evolution of DK Metcalf as like an elite receiver in this league. So I think the markets moved pretty hard on them too. Uh, probably even more so than the Rams. So when I do my market rankings, which are based on past closing point spreads, uh, they would actually favor Seattle by about a half point, 0. 0.7 points here. Um, the data from this year actually favors uh, the Rams quite a bit. Um, and the the thing that I noticed in the numbers is that this Ram team actually looks a lot like the 2018 version that made it to the Super Bowl in the sense that they were like, they were good. They were above average at pass offense. Um, they're eighth when I look at adjusted success rate, but they're elite in terms of running the ball. So they're first by adjusted success rate. And it's not like a little, it's like a lot. And, you know, we, we always talk, you know, we always kind of trash on running backs and, and running the ball. But like, if you can do that consistently, that that is a benefit to your offense. And that was really what was propelling them two years ago. Um, also the defense in, in both years, I think the defense in 2018 was better, uh, but this defense is pretty solid at 10th in my adjusted success rate. Um, so the numbers this year do favor uh, the Rams. When you kind of put together all three aspects of the model, uh, it gives a slight edge to the Los Angeles Rams in this game, 0.3 points. Um, I think I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I definitely would lean towards Seattle. You definitely like to bet on the better quarterback, which is certainly Russell Wilson in this case. The only thing that makes me a little bit cautious is that they're probably going to miss their top two cornerbacks, another team that that – well, they were terrible with these two guys. <laughs> but they're going to be worse without them, without Quentin Dunbar and Shaquille Griffin in this game. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely lean towards Seattle in this game, but um, but because of those injuries, I'm I'm, I'm a little hesitant. And you, we're talking about the Rams rushing game. Daryl Henderson was able to return to practice on Thursday, and like I just love thinking about him because it makes me think back to college when he was at Memphis and just like – Every carry was like a 60 yard run, which is great for like college football DFS if you're in a state where that was legal. Yeah. Uh, but it's fun to think about that. And he's been good. I mean, I think that he's number one in pro football focus is great for running backs. And like, like you said, like running backs don't matter as much as passing game. But if you're an outlier, like that can be beneficial as well. The thing that I like about this Rams team against the Seahawks offense is that. They're not going to get pressure on Jared Goff. Uh, the Seahawks, I think, are seventh, have the seventh worst pressure rate defensively. And if Jared Goff has time, he can be a really good quarterback. So I think that it's definitely intriguing. But I, I agree with you. Like, it's hard to, like, not go with Seattle when it's Russell Wilson right. against Jared Goff. Like, right. as much as I think the, the Seahawks or the, the Rams will put up points here, I can't get – like, I am past the days where I'm betting against Russell Wilson. I refuse. Right. Like. Right. I don't I don't want to ever write something off. But like I'm very close to never betting against Russell Wilson, even though it's been beneficial a couple of times this year because the markets have been so reactive to right. what they've done. Right. But I've also bet on Deshaun Watson a lot this year for those exact same reasons and gotten burned by that terrible, terrible defense. Um, numbers wise, they're not quite as terrible as my eyes make them seem. So I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to stick with that a little bit. So there's always a balance here, but yeah. like the quarterback discrepancy here is, it's pretty big. Yeah. I think I would say. Absolutely. The good thing for the Rams too, that, uh, is something that whale capper talked about. Uh, Dredinsic talked about a couple weeks ago where that Miami game where they just got obliterated. That was their fourth game on the East coast for the year. And right. they had, uh, had only three home. They've had only three home games so far. And this is week 10. So, That'll help uh, right. for sure, but I do think that, you know, if I were to make a bet in this game, I, I'd probably lean towards you and go with the Seahawks, but just it's so hard. Like, logically, it makes sense to go Rams, but I just can't. I can't. Right. I can't bet against right. Russell Wilson. My heart. I, I value my health, and therefore, <laughs> yeah. I will pass. Well, and, and also, like, when we start getting closer to the playoffs and the Super Bowl here, like, I, I really think the NFC is about which quarterback plays the best, yeah. right? You talk about Seattle, Green Bay, New Orleans. Those guys can all sling it. 
Um, and it's like, you know, one of the defenses might show up when it matters, but like, I'm not counting on that. No, I'm counting on the quarterback to get it done. So, uh, oh yeah, we should probably throw Brady in there and maybe the Tampa Bay defense might be the one that can, you know, maybe swing a game, but, uh, it's, it's going to be wild. It's going to be wild when we get into the playoffs in the NFC. If you look at NFC odds right now for the, for the conference championship, uh, New Orleans and Seattle are plus 350. Green Bay and Tampa Bay are plus 450, and nobody else shorter than 10. Like, that's – there's yeah. no runaway favorite there. And like, <laughs> there's no NFC East team in there? <laughs> no, shockingly. Uh, the, the shortest – the Eagles are actually 17-1. to 1. I think it's because their playoff odds are probably so high, um, if I had to guess. Right. Uh, but, like, I mean, the, the Cardinals are shorter, and they're the third-ranked team in the NFC West. <laughs> wow. So Yeah. Well, I'll show you something. It's a wild year for sure, but I think that we'll we'll learn a lot this week with the the Cardinals getting a tough test and the the Rams and the Seahawks doing their thing too. So it should be a pretty fun weekend of action. If you believe the Rams win this game, maybe you want to get down now on the Rams uh, ten to one to win the NFC Championship because it would put them in a good position relative to Seattle and in a good position in that division as well. Covering the future. All right, so that's what Ed's numbers say about week number 10. Ed, thank you for diving into those. And uh, the big one there was the Bills plus two against the – or the Bills plus one and a half against the Cardinals there, so make sure you get that one. Uh, If you can get two, you know, uh, search around for that as well. You can get two. Absolutely. Uh, My cover in the future for this week is going back to that Giants-Eagles game, and I don't want the Eagles. I want the over at 44-and-a-half for this game because I like to target teams that are getting healthier. And – it's easy to spot a team that is getting less healthy, you know, guys like Odell Beckham getting hurt, stuff like that. We can spot that easily, but getting more healthy, I think, tends to fly under the radar from a betting perspective. So I am in on the over this week for the Giants and the Eagles with the Eagles getting healthier. They've had both Lane Johnson and Isaac Sayamalu at practice this week. Sayamalu might not be ready just yet, but he was actually working at left guard in practice on Thursday alongside Jason Peters. And you're probably not doing that on a Thursday practice unless you plan to play the guy. So I think there's decent odds say Amalu returns. And that's really interesting because for the entire season, again, this is week 10, they've had Lane Johnson and Isaac say Amalu on the field for 25 snaps the entire year. If they're both back, That'd be huge for this Eagles offense. But even if it's just Lane Johnson, the Eagles are trending up. They got Jalen Rager and Dallas Goddard back in Week 8. Even if they don't get Sayamalu back, you could argue this is going to be the healthiest they've been in at least a month. And they get that just in time for a tangle with Number Fire's 23rd-ranked defense after adjusting for schedule that's heavily weighted towards the passing game, as we talked about before, because passing does matter. So uh, I think they're ninth in success rate against running backs, but 23rd overall defense. They did play, these two teams did, back in Week 7. So this is a divisional rematch, and that can sometimes favor unders. But based on what I've done from a research perspective, it's shown that that's more so true when quarterbacks are dependent on efficiency. And at a total of 44.5, you're not counting on efficiency. These quarterbacks are not efficient, so I'm not counting on that. And I think that that's why I'm willing to overlook the fact they did just play each other. The other reason I think that this game is intriguing is that the Eagles' defense is is fine, uh, but not one that's like prohibitive by any means. They're like 13th in schedule-adjusted defense over at number fire, so I think both sides should be able to move the ball here and put up some points, and the total does not reflect that. I think that we talked about this cup like pretty early on. If you can find a total that's under 45 with two starting quarterbacks still in there, it's hard to turn it down. You could argue if Carson Wentz has played like a starting level quarterback uh, by for sure so far this year, but I still think that uh, leaning over here at 44 and a half is a way to go. Nothing problematic weather-wise either, so I feel pretty good about the over here at 44 and a half. And I know you said you don't like uh, you don't like your totals numbers as much, but do they have a read on this game at all? 44 and a half. Uh, I mean, not really. I mean, it's under which you would expect, given yeah. that the, you know the market data is is part of that. It's about about 41. Um, you know, when you think about matchups and how bad the Giants pass defense is, uh, you know, maybe Carson Wentz can do something if he can just avoid the turnovers. If that's a, that's a big, if that is a big, if there, but I think, Hey, if he's going to turn it over, at least throw a pick six. Cause that's, yeah, exactly. that's great for overs. So Carson, exactly. come through free buddy. If you're going to throw a pick, 
make it count. That is all that we have for this week here on Covering the Spread. As mentioned, do not forget to check out our discussion with Mike Craig about Week 11 in college football. A lot of good stuff from him and just a good conversation in general. You can find that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank and on the Football Analytics Show? Yeah, so a couple of exciting things. I talked to Kevin uh, Cole on the Football Analytics Show, great data scientist that really understands football. So so go check that out. Uh, also, Drew Martin is going to start doing some videos um, based on my numbers. So he, he breaks down games in the way Drew Martin breaks down games, but he, he mentions my numbers. And so it's just another way to get some college football predictions um, that you would otherwise have to get by becoming a member of my site. Um I don't really have a link for you. It's on my Twitter. It's on my Twitter. I'll probably tweet about it again tonight. Um, but but Drew is doing that. Uh, I think that's making me start uh, the Power Rank YouTube channel. Actually, it has made me start the Power Rank oh, YouTube. Oh, okay. So there'll probably be some other things. Um, maybe even talk to to you guys about putting putting some of the audio and and sure. some video with some video uh, of some of the things that we talk about. But, um, yeah, so Drew Martin is going to be doing videos. He's going to be doing it every week. So the power right now is a YouTube channel. So go check it out. Man, big getting free agency for Ed. I like this. This is really cool. What is the, the power rank uh, YouTube handle? I guess it's just a it's username. Just the power rank. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you can search for the power rank. For this. Like, I usually have something like the power rank.info or the power yeah, yeah. rank something to, to send you over there. Um, whenever you start something new, there's always, like – you know, they, it always kind of sucks at the beginning <laughs> selling this new YouTube channel. But like when I first started a podcast, even when I listened to podcasts that I did a couple years ago, oh I'm like, gosh, what the, I mean, what the heck was I doing? So if I read a, an article that I wrote a year ago, I hate myself for like the entire way through. It's like, why would you say that? That's terrible wording. You couldn't have said this in fewer words. What are you talking about? This is stupid. That's not funny. Why'd you try that? <laughs> I think you're probably being a little bit too hard on yourself. I don't but know. <laughs> it shows the, you know, the the emphasis on improvement, which yeah. which everyone everyone should have. But um, but anyways, it's just getting started. Uh, Drew's going to be doing something every week for college football heading into the bowl season. I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I, I am definitely going to try to put some short clips up of of you know things that are more evergreen that we talk about on the football analytics show. So just use that audio as. As some uh, as part of video content as well, and then I don't know, maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll break down NFL games once the playoffs get here. Um, so we'll see. But you've already got an in-house ringer with your son. Like your son's a YouTube like genius. So like just talk to him. Like have him do yeah. it. Yeah, he, yeah. So my son definitely does does the YouTube as well. Um, but uh, he you know he's kind of on a little bit of a break. We're trying to we're kind of trying to push him back into doing things a little bit more regularly. Well, when he first started, he was banging them out every week which was good. Yeah. And now he's trying to do these more sophisticated things, which, which is good, but yeah. it takes. We'll just get him on the power rank YouTube and uh, go from there. And, and until then, Drew Martin is a nice way to hold things over for sure. Until we can get your son over there. So find that by going to Ed's Twitter at the power rank. Also check out the football analytics show for that discussion with Kevin Cole, who's one of my favorite analysts as well. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel podcast network at FanDuel podcast. We had our NFL DFS preview podcast up today with myself, Brandon Gadula. You can find that by searching for the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed. Really fun week 10 main slate. So find that over over there. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck with your bets for Week 10, also for Week 11 in college football, also for the Masters. Have fun in what should be a really fun sports weekend. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>